This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. Today in studio, we have Dr. John Cox. Dr. Cox is an assistant professor of wildlife and conservation biology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. And today we're going to be focusing on deer and your deer research. Um, now, we've had you in studio before, but for our new listeners, tell us a little bit about what you do at UK. So I primarily do research and teaching on terrestrial vertebrates like elk, black bear, white-tailed deer, those kinds of species. Okay, great, great. So could you give us a, uh, some background about white-tailed deer? Well, like the, the coyote and the black bear, the, the white-tailed deer uh, is really a distinctly unique large mammal species. It originated in, and is really only native to North America, although some have been introduced to other countries where it's become a pest. White-tailed deer are um, a very old evolutionary species that belongs to what we call the deer family or cervidae. And it has dozens of species found globally and it's located on all continents except uh, Australia and Antarctica. Uh, white-tailed deer are pretty remarkable and adaptable hooved animals that thrive in a variety of habitat types and are very resilient to natural and human disturbance. They're found from southern Canada all the way through Central America and down into Peru in uh, South America. So there are very few habits or habitats in North America that the white-tailed deer have not become r really well established. Uh, you find large-bodied white-tailed deer in the evergreen forest of Canada and New England, uh, smaller white-tails in the deserts of the southwestern U.S., and even in the Florida Keys where the smallest white-tailed deer, the Florida key deer, hangs on as a federally endangered subspecies despite all the hurricanes and the tourists that uh, frequently come through there. Now most deer in the east weigh between 100 and 225 pounds, but the small Florida key deer actually only weighs about 50 pounds and is only about 30 inches to shoulder height. Uh, while those from southern Canada, some of those guys have measured up to 500 pounds. Wow. So deer were ubiquitous, uh, meaning that they were found throughout Kentucky before European settlement, and they were widely used by Native Americans for food, hides, and other products. Uh, Overhunting and habitat lost loss from uh, market hunters and settlers took its toll really to the point where we were down to around 2,000 deer in the early 1900s. In uh, an aggressive restocking of those deer and game law enforcement has now allowed deer to get up to about a million animals in Kentucky with an annual harvest of between 125,000 to 150,000 deer. So that's, that's quite an annual harvest. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like a lot of the hooved animals of the world, uh, deer species, including whitetails, have these growth structures that project from the top of their skull. Uh, the difference is that groups like antelopes and livestock have horns made of small bony project, or projects or projections covered in keratin. And keratin is essentially the same basic protein as hair and fingernails. And those horns are usually permanent and they continuously grow and they're often worn by both sexes. Deer, on the other hand, have antlers that are essentially bony growths that are shed every year, which is really uh, a tremendous biological feat that requires a lot of uptake of minerals, good nutrition, and hormonal production. Uh, except for reindeer, uh, which we also know as caribou, only the males of the deer species grow antlers. And because it costs so much energy to grow these antlers, large antler deer are basically showing females how fit they are. Those antlers are not just for show though. Uh, they're used to display and fight or what is called sparring during the breeding season or the rut. 
and that's where males defend territories uh, and their females. Uh, most deer don't actually begin breeding until they are about a year and a half old and typically they reach full body size somewhere between two and four years of age. Mm-hmm. So what would you say are some interesting biological facts about the deer? Um, well, I would say probably one of the most interesting stories is about this extremely fast-growing biological tissue called antlers. Uh, it's, it is thought to be perhaps the second fastest growing biological tissue just behind many types of cancer. Um, and the growth of those bony structures is essentially a combination of, of light or sunlight, hormones, nutrition, age, and genetics. So it, the information about the amount of light that comes in to a deer through its eyes, or what we call the photo period, that is transmitted to the what we call the pineal gland of the brain. And that determines antler growth and breeding cycles. So as the amount of light increases, uh, antler growth, or what we call antlerogenesis, occurs until about late July or August. And what we have here is that the growing antlers are covered with a velvet sheath of nerve and blood vessels that are essentially nourishing the underlying bony growth of antler. And then in late summer, as the as the uh, sunlight begins to decrease, hormonal cues signal that it's time to stop growing antlers. And the vascular tissue is really no longer needed in its, in its uh, shed. Uh, higher testosterone levels also at this time cause the bony structures to increasingly calcify and harden. And so deer start to itch and often rub the velvet off those antlers using trees. And that cleans and polishes the antlers as they gear up for the upcoming fall breeding season known as the rut. Now yearling deer typically have single spike antlers and they add points and mass to the main beam and the tines as they age up to around five to eight years where they typically peak in size. Uh, but in most really populous states, such as New York and New Jersey, deer seldom live to get to those prime ages because they are heavily hunted. So we're lucky in many ways that Kentucky has done a, a really great job over the years managing deer uh, to maintain a balance of quality and quantity of, of those animals. So after the breeding season is over, the low amounts of daylight and testosterone levels actually cause the bucks to shed their antlers in the winter. So that's a tremendous cost that those buck deer have to undergo every year for this process. Another interesting fact about deer is just how fast that they can run. I mean, they can go up to 45 miles an hour, but they're not long, good long distance runners and they don't have much endurance like elk. And that's primarily because deer's primary predators are cougars and bobcats, which use ambush tactics, and they're not in it for the long pursuit. Whereas uh, the elk are primarily hunted by wolves, which are great long distance runners. And so when you watch deer flee, they will often spring or bound away from danger. And when they feel safe, they'll, and that's usually in wooded areas or some kind of a cover, They'll turn around to locate the danger and decide whether or not they need to spend more energy further escaping the predator. Um, Deer are also really good swimmers and they can cross cross small rivers. And down in Florida, for example, we see them move from island to island among the Florida Keys across relatively short distances of a few miles. Um, And so one of the reasons that deer have proliferated so much in the east over the past 50 years is that we have an absence of large predators to help control their numbers. Coyotes, bobcats, and even black bears, they do take some deer, but it's clearly, um, even with the addition of hunting by humans, not been enough to regulate numbers in many areas of, particularly of the eastern United States. Uh, another unique behavior of white-tailed deer is what's called flagging. So white-tailed deer are also sometimes called the Virginia deer, or they're also called flagtails. And that's because they frequently raise their tail to reveal a white rump patch when they're startled or frightened. And that's a behavior that's designed to tell predators, hey, you know, you've been spotted, and it's also to alert fellow deer to danger. Deer also uh, will stamp their hooves to try and get predators to reveal themselves. 
and they will do what's called blowing where they make this sound like shh, shh, like that and they weave and bob their head around to try to get a better look at predators because their eyes are on the side of their head and that means that they have much less depth perception in 3D vision than predators or humans. So they're trying to get that 3D perspective by moving their head around. They're also trying to get the predator to move. Um, they also have pretty poor color vision and that's why hunters wear blaze orange uh, during gun season. And the deer really don't take much notice of that. <laughs> so deer certainly have a lot of tricks up their sleeve to evade predators and one of those, and perhaps uh, the best, is their extremely good sense of smell. And you have an entire industry of hunting products and clothing that's been built to try mask or control human scent of hunters. And they also hear very well too, and they're able to rotate their ears independently to try and what we call triangulate where sounds are coming from. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that they are prolific markers of their territory. And most people don't know that, but deer have glands on their forehead and on their legs, and they deposit that scent throughout their territory. So when you're out observing deer on a regular basis, uh, particularly, let's say, if you own a farm and you see those deer quite often, you'll see that deer have a seasonal color change in their coat with a gray, uh, thicker winter coat that comes on in the fall, and then they shed that when it starts getting warmer, and they put on a more reddish summer coat in spring. And that's simply just to better acclimate to the changing seasons, and that's also to help them blend in with their environment as it changes. And one might also notice uh, when they're looking around for deer sign that deer tracks typically only have two, what we might look at, or might call crescent-shaped hoof marks from the middle two toes. But they actually have two smaller vestigial toes in the back called dew claws. And sometimes when the deer are walking through mud or other softer substrates like snow, uh, you can see those two back deer dew claws. And it's thought that those toes may help them with balance and traction in, uh, in uneven or, or soft terrain. In terms of what deer eat, um, they eat quite a variety of foods, uh, particularly a number of grasses, number of forbs, tree saplings, uh, seasonal fruits like persimmon, uh, dogwood, uh, and they also eat a lot of what we call hard mast, so things like acorns, beech nuts, and others. Uh, and of course, to the dismay of many farmers, uh, deer predate quite a bit on agricultural crops. And one of the things that uh, people will often notice when they get out into the woods and kind of knock around, or if they have, let's say, natural gas wells on their property, is that they will notice these dugout spots. Um, and so what deer do is essentially dig up dirt in some of these areas to sift minerals. And that's a process what we known as geophagy or mineral eating. And that often occurs at regular spots called salt or mineral licks. And those are pretty small here in the eastern United States, but if you go to a place like East Africa, some of those mineral licks uh, can extend for you know an acre to two acres in size. They're quite large. Uh, some people feed deer with shelled corn, uh, particularly around hunting season, but I would caution them that this practice can cause long-term problems because deer often get digestive issues or they get diseases of the liver and other problems that can be debilitating or even fatal to those, to those individuals. Hmm. That's all very interesting. So um, what are some of the pressing issues with regards to deer numbers and their impacts uh, with people? Well, as I mentioned earlier, deer recovery in the U.S. has been quite remarkable. And many would argue that it's probably the most remarkable wildlife success story that's been driven by extensive and sustained management and, and dollars over many decades. Uh, there are probably more deer in North America now than, than when Columbus arrived. And as deer numbers in increase or stay high, the human population continues to increase and in, in encroach into wildlife habitat. And that, of course, creates conflict between deer and people. So there are a few issues here as the, the clash between deer and people uh, increases over time. And uh, the first thing that I'll note would be 
that motorists, you know, have really got to be careful, of, you know, driving highways, particularly during the breeding season. You know, deer are moving all over the place and they're not paying attention. I myself have struck a couple of deer. It's not a pleasant experience. It's very can be very costly. You know, in the U.S. alone, there's over a billion dollars a year in auto collision damages from deer, and about 100 to 200 people die during those collisions. And that is far more than than essentially all the predator-related deaths, which get all the media attention, like cougar attacks in California or shark attacks in the Atlantic. You know. Deer seem gentle and non-threatening, and as humans, we tend to overestimate the low risks that they might pose. Um, but we often overestimate higher risks, like being attacked by domestic dogs or striking a deer, you know, at high speed. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. For those of you who may be just joining us each week towards the beginning of the show, we will play a wildlife sound from the forest. So here's our sound for today. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we will tell you what this animal is and why it makes this sound. Welcome back. We are in studio talking with Dr. Cox on white-tailed deer. Let's get back to that interview. So tell us when breeding season is. So the rut in Kentucky typically starts somewhere between the second to third week of October and usually goes through the second to third week of November. And sometimes you can have what's called a secondary rut, uh, which occurs in, in early December. Okay. So you mentioned that deer lose their antlers, like even the 10 plus pointers. And so, um, so even the large ones regrow every year. It's not just the, the small yeah, that's right. So they get rid of their antlers uh, pretty much every year. Uh, and the, the thinking behind that is that it's a anti-predatory strategy. So if you have just ran yourself ragged during the mating season, you're really tired, you don't have much energy, here comes a harsh winter, your energy reserves are really low, you may not be able to escape predators that well. So if you drop all that ornamentation that you've got on top of your head, it might be a little bit easier to blend into to some of your uh, your cover, hiding cover, I guess, and uh, sort of hold off until the spring comes back around and you can start feeding on more nutritious foods again. Can they drop it off at a certain point or does it just do it at a certain time of year? Um, so the drop off or what's called the shedding of the antlers is typically controlled by testosterone. Mm -hmm. So the males that breed first are typically those that will drop their antlers first and that can actually begin as early as mid-December. Typically it's more like late December or early January but they can uh, actually hold on to them as far as uh, early March. And how long does it take them to grow? So we're looking at about three four months of, okay. of growth time there so they have to take in a tremendous amount of nutrition and minerals to get those things built back up. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking a little bit about the intelligence of deer. So are they smart animals? Yeah, the, uh, deer are pretty smart animals. Um, and I would say that they may not be as savvy, I guess, during the rut uh, when they're out there looking for mates. And uh, they might be what we might think of as starry-eyed. And they're out there just pursuing pursuing does, particularly the bucks, and running all over the place and ignoring danger. And that's really why we time the, the gun season to that uh, sort of peak of rut there, to take advantage of that. Yeah, so um, I know you mentioned with the, um, you know, the, when the breeding season is, and then just kind of in general, are there certain times 
when you're out driving that you should avoid driving i guess to avoid deer or, or be more they, careful yeah, yeah. Be more careful well, i would say year too. round uh, what's called creep huscular hours and that is about an hour before and after sunrise and an hour before and after sunset are typically when deer do a lot of moving but then when you get into the rutting period um, deer can like i said move quite a bit more and act a little crazier and they will move uh, long distances and ignore vehicles and people a lot even during the middle of the night and even sometimes during the day. So I would pay particular attention uh, during late October and through mid to s- mid-November in terms of trying to avoid deer. So you see the, the signs on the road, they'll have like the deer crossing signs. And is that just a normal path for them to take? Is that why pe- they put them up? The deer crossing signs are put up by the Department of Transportation and they typically indicate a high frequency of deer vehicle collisions. Uh-huh. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. I was just wondering about that because you hmm. see them occasionally, you know, yeah. those yellow signs and you'll see a deer on them and you're wondering, it's like, what, what made them put that there, you yeah. know? So wildlife agencies have a daunting challenge to try and lower deer numbers in areas where they have high populations and sometimes where they're not allowed to hunt. Um, So in many areas currently, the deer exceed what we might call the, the social carrying capacity of the community. And that's basically what people will tolerate. So tying in with this, when you have high deer numbers, you also get a lot of crop damage and that's we we currently have a research led by dr matt springer who you may have heard about on other um, radio shows here and he's been leading research to assess how white-tailed deer impact soybeans in western kentucky so they do quite a bit of damage to a variety of crops Um, but another emerging issue for kentuckians and one that's kind of sneaking up on people here, not so much in the in other parts of the eastern U.S. though, is this rise of what we call zoonotic diseases or animal carrying diseases that impact human health. Uh, Deer Harbor was called the black-legged tick and that is the one that carries Lyme disease bacteria and it's a disease that has essentially become an epidemic in the northeastern U.S. and in the Midwest with uh, really tens of thousands of cases now per year, and that number is only rising. So um, Lyme disease cases are now showing up in Kentucky. Uh, We don't have very many, but it is making its way into the Commonwealth. Uh, Other tick-borne diseases that ticks have, which deer carry, are things like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which also has been reported in our state as well. And coupled with uh, this increase in number of deer and the increase in number of ticks uh, are increasing temperatures from global warming, which are only expected to get worse. And this essentially allows ticks and other disease-causing organisms to stay around longer and better survive the winters and thrive in this warmer climate. And unfortunately, this is a disease phenomenon that is really unfolding right before our eyes. Yeah, I know that, that ticks can be quite a bit of right. a problem. <laughs> yes, Thank you for telling us about some of those impacts on the people. Um, now, I know you've been doing a lot of research on deer. Can you tell us what you've been conducting, what type of research you've been conducting? Yeah, so while one, wild-tailed deer are probably the most well-studied large mammal on the planet because it's just such of such high importance to human culture and, and to the economy. And uh, billions of dollars every year are spent in the pursuit of hunting wild-tailed deer in the U.S. and license sales support hunting and conservation and management of not only deer but other game species too. Uh, And hunters and wildlife watchers spend a lot of money that aids local economies where deer occur. So naturally there's going to be a lot of attention and a lot of research focused on white-tailed deer. So what we just recently concluded was a three-year study of white-tailed deer in southeastern Kentucky down in Clay and Leslie counties. And this work was done in coordination with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources um, and the U.S. Forest Service. And our purpose there was to try and understand some of the reasons that this heavily forested and uh, sparsely human populated region has had historically low deer numbers. And that's despite years of restocking efforts to increase those numbers. And as a result of that, most of these counties are managed as what what are called zone four. 
and that means that they that they have restrictions on the hunting regulations in terms of allowing hunters to take fewer deer. So people had in that area had speculated that poaching uh, disease or the recent arrival of coyotes or even elk may have driven deer numbers down. So what we did was we captured and radio collared over a hundred d- adult does in about the same number of fawns and we wanted to estimate how many of those survive year to year and what were the main sources of mortality for those individuals. And so that involved um, shooting adult deer with darts or catching them in an individual or group traps and all of which involved tranquilizing them so that we could work on them in a way that was safe to us and the deer. Uh, The radio collar itself works by emitting a radio signal on a unique frequency that you can tune to with a radio receiver, kind of like tuning into a radio station. So most of the does were equipped with what we call a a VIT, or a vaginal implant transmitter. And basically this is placed in the birth canal of a pregnant doe, and when she gives birth to it, uh, she drops to the ground or the the transmitter drops to the ground, excuse me, which activates the transmitter, and that lets us know that there is a fawn on the ground. And so in the spring, we caught a lot of fawns this way at a very early age. And But we also caught a few others by just watching the behavior of those in the spring because they tend to be very protective and hang around where they have their fawns. And so doing those research, those random uh, searches in fields actually helped us quite a bit. So uh, once we captured the fawns and we fitted them with a, a collar, um, we, we put what's called an expandable unit or expandable collar on these little fawns. And they have a series of stitched seams on the band that goes around the neck. And as the fawn grows, those seams are kind of weak and they pop and they expand as the fawn grows in size. And so they work for about a year. And um, after releasing those radio collar deer, we ended up monitoring those from the ground and sometimes from an airplane for, for a year or more. And when a deer died, we, uh, we went in and we investigated the scene as soon as possible to try and determine the cause of death. So when we started, we thought we'd see a lot of poaching or predation on deer by coyotes, but we had a remarkably high and I would say unexpected annual survival rate of 90% of adult does. So basically nine out of every 10 adult does would survive to the following year, which is pretty high. Uh, About 43% of our fawns uh, survived through about year one. And that's about typical for this region of the U.S. Uh, Some of those fawns were eaten by uh, coyotes or bobcats. Hmm. You've provided us with a lot of great information. So um, what would be one or two takeaway items that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um, so, well, I would encourage readers uh, to learn to learn more about the fascinating biology of deer species and not just our own white-tailed deer. I mean, we have elk here in Kentucky and we have moose up north and mule deer out in the western part of the United States. But I would say more importantly, I would encourage the listeners to spend uh, some time out in the woods with our uh, wonderful wildlife, and that includes deer, because what we're finding increasingly in our stressful world is that people really need a refuge and a, and a chance at a small measure of peace. And science is telling us that spending time in the outdoors can do wonders for our physical and mental health and, and really kind of allows us to ponder our place uh, in a larger universe. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Cox, for joining us today. And if you would like more information on what you've heard in this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. This week we have a guest with us from the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. It's one of our wildlife faculty, Steve Price, Associate Professor of Stream Riparian Ecology. And he's going to talk about this sound you heard earlier. All 
right, so tell us what that sound was. Well, that was the sound of the Cope's gray tree frog, which is actually a very common tree frog that we have in here in Kentucky. It's a relatively small, kind of plump tree frog with, uh, with usually some kind of bumps or warts on its back and bright le- yellow thighs on its hind legs. These tree frogs call um, commonly from all kinds of habitats. Usually there's some forests nearby, but they'll call from um, little ponds, uh, flooded fields, even sometimes people's bird baths in their yard, and they'll call in uh, May from, from May until uh, usually the middle of July or late July mm-hmm. um, each year. Okay, all right. So we have another sound as well. Okay. All right, now tell us what that was. Well, that was a, a sound of, a, of a, a frog, actually a toad, the American toad. So they give out these long trills, sometimes lasting up to 30 seconds long. And, um, and they, will, they will make these calls usually in March and April here in Kentucky. So most of the listeners are probably familiar with toads. Mm-hmm. They're kind of stocky, chunky little frogs. They're covered in warts. And um, people see them in their backyards um, often, uh, but they're found in all kinds of habitats in Kentucky, including um, in in our forests. And um, a lot of people believe that if you touch a toad and touch its its warts, that you will actually develop warts as well. But I that's was just going to ask you that. Yeah, but that's not <laughs> the case. Not the case. Um, these are glands that the toad has on its back, and these glands kind of excrete a little distasteful poison um, and they make it so you know other animals don't want to eat the toad right if you put a toad in your mouth it doesn't doesn't taste very good (laughs) right so So what are the warts purpose then is is just the 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 other glands just the glands so there's not there's not anything else it's just no i didn't know if you like saw them if there was something that would deter animals from actually wanting to eat the toad because of the warts on them? I'm sure a lot of our woodland animals know not to eat a toad or Uh especially if they they want to eat it sometimes they might flip it over or something (laughs) so they don't get those warts in its mouth. Uh Um, A lot of our our pets though don't realize that so like our dogs and stuff sometimes you'll see a dog that's chewed on a toad and and uh, it'll drop the toad and usually the toad's okay but the Uh dog sometimes will have a excessive amount of saliva coming from its mouth or something right. like that because it doesn't taste very good. Okay, so th- is there a difference? You use toad and frog. Is there a difference between the two? Yeah, a, fro- a toad is just a specialized type of, of frog. Okay. And we use that term for kind of these um, types of frogs that have shorter legs, rougher skin, usually mm-hmm. a lot of warts are present. But mm-hmm. Really, a toad is just a specialized specialized fro- frog. Frog, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. well, thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate All it. All right, no problem. All right, thank you for joining us today. Um, you've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky. If you have any questions about things that you heard on today's show, please visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned each Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. for another edition of From the Woods, Kentucky. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.